Well, good morning, everyone. It's still morning, just. Um, it's good to be back. Um, I, some of you I don't recognize, and some of you may don't recognize me, but um, that's, gr that's great as well to see new people here. Um, I want to say thank you very much to all those that have um, been continuing keeping St. Luke's going, as um, St. Luke's isn't about the vicar. Um, it's about everyone doing, working together, and um, that's been happening brilliantly while I've been away, and I'm sure will continue to happen brilliantly um, now I'm back. Um, but it's good also to have a chance to, to look at God's Word together and to think about that. If you haven't got the Bible open in front of you, you might want to turn to pages 184, 185, 186 in the Bibles, um, sort of Deuteronomy 5 and 6, because um, we're starting a series on the Ten Commandments. So let's pray as we begin to think about that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's here for us today. And as we share together in looking at it, help me to speak your words clearly and faithfully by the Spirit and by your Spirit. May you open our hearts to hear what you want us to hear and to understand what you want us to understand. Amen. Well, I wonder what you feel about the Ten Commandments. Um, maybe you're thinking... Oh, I hope he didn't ask me what they are. <laughs> Apparently, it's, it's actually canon law that, um, and I only learned this recently, that when you're confirmed, before you're confirmed in the Church of England, you're meant to be made sure that you've memorized all the Ten Commandments. So that's a test, isn't it? That's a challenge for you. Um, they're actually in, in most churches as well. If you um, look over here, um, on the side here, there's the Ten Commandments on the wall. Um, at St. George's, the Ten Commandments is on the wall at the front. If you go to the Sailor's Church tonight, the Ten Commandments are on the wall there. Um, they're a key part of what it is to be a Christian. I wonder how you feel about them, though. All those do's and do nots, mainly do nots. Um, is that the sort of thing you think we're all about? Um, if you got, get the church email, um, you'll know that at the bottom I often put links of um, interesting blogs or articles to read online. And um, one of those that I put on this week was a by, by a guy called Ping, Paul Kingsnorth. Um, he's someone who's had an interesting journey. I'd recommend reading the article. Um, he's had an interesting journey to faith, but he started off very much being brought up in a non-Christian family. He's only slightly younger than me, so he's sort of brought up in the 80s, a um, long time ago. But um, the attitude of the world that he describes then is very much, if not more so, the attitude of the world now. And he says this about, about the sort of general view of, of religion, of Christianity. He says, religion was irrelevant. It was authoritarian, it was superstitious, it was feeble proto-science. It was the theft of our precious free will by authorities who wanted to control us by telling us fairy tales. It repressed women, gay people, atheists, anyone who disobeyed by its irrational edicts. It hated science, denied reason, burned witches and heretics by the million. Post-enlightenment liberal societies had thrown off its shackles. Now, I could probably speak for hours about a lot of the false things that are in that statement. A lot of misunderstandings, a lot of lies. And yet, if we're honest, that is the attitude of a lot of people in our society about Christianity in the church, whether it's true or not. And particularly that line in there that um, really struck me was the line, um, the theft of our precious free will. When we come to think about the Ten Commandments, do, do we think about them as taking away our free will? Having to submit to, to God's authority over us when we'd rather just go on and do our own thing. I mean, yes, most people would say, well, there's, there's good things in the Ten Commandments. You know, most people would say it's right not to murder. Anyone disagree with that? Hands up. <laughs> most people would say it's right not to commit adultery although they often joke about the Bible that was published in the 17th century that by accident had do commit adultery in it. Um, they think it's right not to steal. But actually that general idea and a lot of the things in the Ten Commandments, people would question, why, why should I submit to God? Why should God be number one in my life? We live in a culture, in a world where many people don't even want to believe in God, let alone take him seriously. So how do we communicate the Ten Commandments in today's world? How do we talk about them when people see them as repressive, oppressive, taking away their freedom? How do we talk to our children about it? I think, Luke, I need you to um, do the thing for me. Thank you. 
one of the um, sadnesses of our world is that generation by generation in this country, the number of people who believe in the Christian faith and follow the Christian faith and go to church and all of that is going down. Each generation, there seems to be less people. And I wonder if that's partly because actually, as Christians, we've given the impression at least that what we're about is commandments without, underst- without giving the story that underlies the commandments. You know, in all the um, um, battles to try and keep Christian morality in our society, have we given the impression that Christianity is just about the morality? so that people have lost sight of the God behind it. In our reading in Deuteronomy verse, chapter 6, if you've got it there, you want to look at verse 20. It's, um, it's a verse um, that says, you know, in the future, when your children ask you, uh, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded us? Moses says, this is how you're meant to respond to them. So Moses is keen that, you know, what, what they're being told in that generation is passed on to the next generation and so on. And he says, how do you answer that question? Now, I, I've, I've always looked at that question in the past and thought, well, you know, it's, you know, children are curious, children are inquisitive, they want to, you know, want to know why things happen. And I've seen it as a sort of, a sort of inquisitive question, you know, you know what, what's the meaning? You know, Dad, explain to me what, what, what's, what's going on here, why have we, why we got these laws? But actually, maybe it's more of a could be seen as more of a kind of rebellious question you know oh dad you're going on about all those laws and regulations that God has given us again I don't want to give up my free I want to do my own thing I don't want to follow these these sort of archaic old-fashioned ways of doing things now what's the meaning of these stipulations decrees and laws that the Lord has given us maybe that's sort of the attitude of our society that's that's the attitude of the new generations and Maybe it's our failure to answer that question well that's part of the reason the church is in decline. And look how Moses tells the parents to answer the question. He could have said to them, you know, well, just tell them, shut up, God says it, just do it. <laughs> now, sometimes that's what we do as parents, isn't it? No. Just do it, I told you to, do it. And sometimes you need to do that because it's an urgent situation. You know, and that's true, isn't it? God is the creator of the universe. Why, why shouldn't we obey what he says? Or maybe they could have, he could have answered it by saying, well, actually, if you follow these rules and regulations, it's good for you. You'll do well in life. And again, that's true, isn't it? And actually, earlier on, Moses sort of says that. You know, you follow these ways, you'll be blessed. You'll flourish in the lands. And in my life, as, I, I, as I've, thankfully, I was, I was brought up well, I became a Christian as a very young child, well, nine-ish, um, and I've been taught God's ways, and I, I learned to follow God's ways. I haven't done it perfectly, but, but I found, looking at the people around me, that following God's ways leads to a much happier and blessed life in the medium term, let alone the long term, compared with people around me that are just doing their own thing. You know, it is a blessing to follow God's ways, but that's not the answer Moses tells them to give. What Moses tells them to do is to tell them the story. The story of how God has saved his people. The story of what God has done for them. And you see, unless we root and found the commandments that God has given in the story of what God has done, then in the minds of future generations, in the minds of the people around us, They'll just feel like condemnations from above. Made up rules and regulations that have nothing to do with reality. And no reason to follow them. And even if you go to the Ten Commandments themselves, and you've got your Bibles open, um, the Ten Commandments actually appears twice in the Bible, once in Exodus 20 and once in Deuteronomy 5. Um, so Deuteronomy 5 is right before Deuteronomy 6, which is handy. So if you've got your Bibles open, it's there. Uh, and if you look at the... the um, the, the, the list of the, the Ten Commandments, it actually, in the, in the Hebrew, it literally says, here are the ten words. It doesn't call them commandments, it calls them words. And there's actually a disagreement amongst different groups about what the ten, which actually count as the Ten Commandments. So, so for Jewish people, who obviously take these scriptures for themselves as well, um, 
they, they, they agree the Ten Commandments, but they, they take as the first word verse 6 of chapter 5. And it's not a commandment. It's, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. It's a summary of the story. Now, as in um, our churches, we, we take that as the prologue to the Ten Commandments. And often when we think about pro, I don't know if you read books and you will skip the prologue. It's the bit at the beginning. But actually, maybe that's a mistake because fundamentally, this is the first part. This is the first word. Moses is saying that if you're going to understand why we should keep the Ten Commandments, why these matter, you need to understand the story. And the story is that God has rescued his people out of slavery. And that's what Moses commands in um, the end of chapter 6, to tell the children as well, tell them the story. And it's a story of promise. It's a story that starts back with Abraham in Genesis. And do you know the story of Abraham? God, God takes Abraham and he, at one point he brings him outside and he shows him the stars in the sky. Now, this wasn't um, Ramsgate when it's often cloudy and lots of lights, street lights, you can't see any stars. This was in the, in the Near East um, where there were no street lights because it was a long, long time ago and the skies were generally clear and you looked up and you saw thousands upon thousands of stars. And God says to Abraham, your descendants will be as numerous as those stars. And Abraham wasn't so sure because he was quite old. His wife was pretty past it and they had no children. But God fulfilled the promise. They had a child, Isaac. Isaac had, another child, had, his, had his own child, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And before you knew it, after a few hundred years, there were lots and lots of Israelites, descendants of Abraham. God kept his promise. And God also promised that he'd bring them into the, the land, the land flowing of milk and honey, the land that he showed to Abraham. And in Deuteronomy, he's about to do that. God is a God of promise. God is faithful. When we see the story, when we see the fact that God makes these promises and after hundreds of years fulfills those promises, we know that this is a God of eternity, a God of all time, a God who is one. The same God is for Abraham, as for Moses, as for Jesus, as for us. God is a God of promise. He is faithful. But God is also about a story of freedom. Thanks, Luke. A story of freedom. You see, they were slaves in Egypt. They were forced to do hard labor to build Egypt cities. They were, um, had their children thrown into the Nile to try and control their numbers. They were oppressed by Pharaoh, who was king of Egypt and seemed to be a god in Egypt and a representative of all the Egyptian gods on earth. The culture of that world oppressed them and treated them harshly and badly, but God rescued them from that. God came and he sent, I know you've done this while I've been away over the summer, God sent the plagues on Pharaoh and the Egyptians and forced him to let them go, proving that he was greater and more mighty than Pharaoh, greater and more mighty than all the gods of Egypt, and showing that he loved the Israelites, that he heard their cry, he saw their pain, and he acted for them. It's a story of freedom that shows us that this God is a God who is mighty, and a God who loves us, who cares for us. And it's a story of rags to riches, a story of generosity. In that reading that um, Lynn read to us, um, Moses tells them that you're about to go into the promised land, and when you get into the promised land, you'll find that there's cities already built for you to live in. There's vineyards already planted for you to take the, the, the um, grapes and olive groves for the olives. Everything's done for you. Everything's ready for you. You've done nothing but I, God, will bring you into the land. I will defeat your enemies. I will give you that place. God is a God of generosity. God wants to bless us. He wants to bring us from rags to riches. God is generous. And, and is, see, Israel needed to hear and remember that story so they could understand why it was important to follow God and to make him number one. 
And that, that is the command, isn't it? It's the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall love, you shall have no other gods before me. In, in other words, God should be number one. God should be in charge. Luke, can we have the slide? Go forward, please. All the other, oh, sort of the Christians, thank you, I've forgotten the Christian story. <laughs> That's important. The, the Exodus story, of course, is a story that's full of people of Israel, but it's also our story because it's the same God. But the same themes come in the Christian story, don't they? God sent Jesus Christ. He sent him as promised. He's a God of promise. He sent him to die for our sins and to rise again from the dead. He's a God of power even over death. He's a God who rescues us from the slavery of our own sin, our own passions, and the corruption of the world around us. He's a God of freedom and a God who loves us so much that he's sent his son to die for us. And he's a God of generosity who wants to give us what we do not deserve, that gift of forgiveness and eternal life. That is the Christian story. And unless we've grasped the Christian story as much as the story of Exodus and we've seen who this God is that the Ten Commandments can tell us to follow, to put as number one in our lives, unless we see the story, we will not understand why it's so important to follow the commands. And so, Luke, the next slide, thank you. And the first command is loyalty to God. To resist those other gods that might come in, those other powers, those other authorities that might want to take our loyalty, running after money, running after possessions or wealth, running after fame, running, just wanting to follow our own desires rather than God's desires. Rather, we're called to put God as number one, to want to follow his will because we know what he's done for us. So, Negatively, in the Ten Commandments, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. But then in Deuteronomy 6, it flips it to the positive way of putting it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Because this is the God who loves you, who rescues you, who takes you out of that world of sin, gives you forgiveness and a promise of eternal life and calls you to be his. We follow that God and live his ways. Paul Kingsnorth, um, late in life through a very strange journey that involved living most of his life thinking there was no God and no spirituality didn't matter, then becoming a Buddhist, um, finding that helpful, but still then deciding that he needed something to worship. So, he became a wicker and started worshipping pagan gods and witchcraft. And then God called him to follow Jesus. And although he resisted the call, finally he came to faith. He ended up going to an Orthodox church in Western Ireland, but he came to faith in Christ. And he says this, I grew up believing that all modern people are taught, what, what all modern people are taught, that freedom meant lack of constraint. But orthodoxy has taught me that this freedom was no freedom at all, but enslavement to the passions, a neat description of the first 30 years of my life. True freedom, it turns out, is to give up your will and follow God's, to deny yourself, to let it come. I'm terrible at this, but at least, at least now I understand the path. It's wonderful that people like Paul Kingsnorth are discovering the joy and the wonder of following the true God, the God who saved us in Jesus Christ. Will you embrace that story afresh or possibly even for the first time? And in doing so, will you commit yourself afresh to make God number one in your lives? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the commandments. As we learn more of them and help us to root them in the story of who you are 
and what you've done for us in saving us, just as you saved the people of Israel. Amen.